Yeah, so uh, thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, in general, Google was super early in supporting GiveDirectly and the sort of Google community broadly, and in helping people out who are extremely poor by sending cash through our platform. And so uh, we've always felt you know, really close to the Google community, and it's nice to be able to come back and talk about what we're up to, um, some of the sorts of debates that are happening within the development and, and other sectors, and uh, how cash, I think, is moving those forward. As uh, Max said, um, uh, I've worn a few different hats at GiveDirectly. When I first started at GiveDirectly, I was in Kenya on the operations side, sort of managing our team, signing people up to receive cash. Uh, I spent a sort of a year and a half or so there, there, about a year and a half in Uganda, and just recently switched back over to the finance side in New York. And what GiveDirectly does is pretty straightforward. We send cash unconditionally to people living mostly in extreme poverty. Uh, that cash is a grant, it's not a loan. People can spend it however they want. Um, in the most typical model, we will send about $1,000 in a couple chunks over the course of a few months, and then people spend it on uh, whatever they want. In total, we've raised almost $150 million to deliver as cash transfers, and we've enrolled over 80,000 households. Because our operations are fairly straightforward, we're able to stay remarkably lean. So on average, about 90% of what we raise for cash transfers gets d delivered directly to people's hands at the end of the day. Um, and then as we're sort of doing all of this work, we're constantly running different types of research studies. And so when we first got started in Kenya, we ran a randomized control trial testing a bunch of different things about cash transfers, com comparing large lump sum cash transfers to recurring, sort of recurring stream transfers, testing whether or not uh, male recipients spend money differently from female recipients, um, as well as the effect of cash transfers on a ton of different outcome variables earnings and assets, consumption, but also things like stress and depression and things like that. Since then, we've done a, n a number of different research studies we can talk about, things like looking at the effects of cash transfers on macro, the sort of macro aspects of the economy, behavioral aspects of cash transfers, um, whether or not sort of how cash transfers affect uh, coffee farmers and how they invest in their farms and things like that. Uh, operationally, the process looks a lot like a sort of sales and customer service operations. We'll go door to door and collect data on the people who could potentially receive cash transfers, run a sort of pretty simple logic to decide who is eligible, then sort of go back and collect a little bit more data and inform them about uh, uh, the program. We'll then send the money typically through mobile money. And so that looks like Venmo, but that you're able to cash out basically anywhere around you. Um, and we can sort of send thousands of payments with a touch uh, on a laptop. And then we have full-time call centers in each of the countries where we work. And so after every time we send payments, we're able to call people up and confirm that they've received it, ask if they have any feedback for Give Directly, and understand if they've had any problems. Now that model of just sort of giving unconditional cash is very different from how we're sort of taught through aphorisms or parables about how we're supposed to approach giving. There's this idea that you're supposed to teach a man to fish or not give him a fish, or that uh, you should give a hand up and not a hand out. Um, and I think behind that there's this idea that giving cash can't be sustainable. And there's also this idea that we should sort of distrust the people we're trying to help somehow, that money, giving them money could be corrupting, or if it's not corrupting, that we just sort of can't trust from the outset that it could be spent well. Behind that basic debate, the stakes are actually remarkably high between sort of how we should approach helping people. Uh, to give you a sense, this is one way of sort of visualizing uh, what's, up, what's up for debate. The blue line is sort of global official development assistance. It's one measure of the sort of total amount that governments are spending in foreign aid. The sort of line that's going down over time is the cost of closing the poverty gap. You can think of this as taking everyone who's below the global poverty line and visualizing how much in cash it would take to get them to the poverty line. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that's a sort of simplistic picture of what's going on, but the kind of basic synthesis is that we have incredible resources available to help the people we're trying to help, to help sort of people in extreme poverty. And a lot of the sort of problem of aid and development is an allocation one, that it's not so much that we need more resources, but we need to better allocate them. And so this debate about how best should we help people is actually extremely important. And so luckily, we don't have to have this debate 
uh, in the sort of arena of sort of dueling assertions. It doesn't have to be this theoretical or philosophical debate about what people are really like. We can test it. Uh, and the development that's happened over the sort of last couple of decades within development econo economics is moving a little bit away from theory towards actually putting things into uh, experiment experimental evaluations. Um, and so the sort of gold standard approach to this is what's called a randomized control trial. It's the same way that we test medicines, by randomly assigning people to either receive or not receive a treatment, and then using external evaluators to sort of test the differences in the uh, different outcome variables between those two groups. We've learned a lot of different things from that, uh, sort of about different inter interventions we use. We've learned that we're actually pretty bad at training people or teaching people to fish, that micro, the sort of effects of microfinance and things like that are actually pretty mixed. We've also learned that the effects of cash are remarkably consistent, that you know, the sort of exact impacts can vary a lot by the structure of the cash transfers or the people who are receiving them or the context, but you see a few consistent themes. First, people spend it pretty well. Uh, you see increases in earnings and consumption, decreases in food insecurity, improvements in nutrition, often increases in uptake on things like health services or actual improvements in health in terms of fewer accidents or better health. Um, you see decreases in stress. Um, to give you a sense of the sort of variety of sort of responses to cash or to security, one study in Malawi tested giving the families of young women uh, small recurring cash payments, so just a little bit of security, not a total game changer. What they found is that those women whose families received got married later, pregnant later, and had lower rates of HIV relative to the control group because they had a little bit more security in society. Uh, on the sort of other side of the spectrum, uh, a study testing giving young, young people about $400 all at once, if they went back and sort of compared that group of people to a control group and found that their earnings were 40% higher. That sort of basic result was mirrored in GiveDirectly's study that found that a year after people received about $1,000, their earnings were 30% higher and their assets were 58% higher. Uh, the other things you, you don't see are the things people are often worried about. There's this sense that if you give people money, they might drink it, or it'll sort of be corrupting and they'll stop working. Um, but all of the evidence we have from what's been a, a, a sort of 165 different studies of cash transfers would suggest that that doesn't happen. Uh, the studies have found that uh, this sort of consumption of, quote, temptation goods, things like alcohol or tobacco or gambling, either has stayed the same for cash recipients or has gone down. And similarly, the work effort, how much time people are spending working, has either stayed the same or gone up in, in the sort of different studies that have been done, done in the developing world. The other thing that's happened over the last, sort of more recently over the last decade, is an explosion in mobile money which has made delivering cash transfers a lot easier. And so today there are 93 countries with mobile money and over 400 million current mobile money users. That makes the sort of job of getting cash into people's hands pretty easy. And the sort of mobile money infrastructure doesn't have to be as, as robust as it is in Kenya, which has the sort of best network in the world. It can actually be uh, sort of pretty lightweight. A study we did in Uganda sort of tested the limits to say how good does the payments infrastructure have to be for mobile payments to work. And so we found just about the most remote place you could go to in Uganda, a place very, very sort of north in the country, just on the border with South Sudan, where people typically would walk something like four or five hours to get to the nearest town, uh, which was also sort of where the nearest paved road would be. We found that if you sort of sent mobile money to a place that actually didn't have any mobile money providers there already, this market responded that the kind of net, the sort of uh, market incentives for cashing people out worked, and uh, agents came to the village to cash people out. And so the sort of technology exists to get cash into people's hands really, really cheaply. As a result of those sort of two trends, there's a ton of different applications where we can use cash transfers to solve or address a bunch of different types of problems. And so to give you a sense, these are some of the projects GiveDirectly is working on uh, around the world. And so the first one is the thing we've done most often. It's these large one-time cash grants of about $1,000. And I think these are best geared if you want to uh, give people sort of investment capital. And so you see bigger increases in earnings, I'd expect, large increases in assets, uh, and things like that. You can also use cash transfers to address humanitarian issues. And so we just started a project in Uganda, uh, which has taken in a lot of different refugees from surrounding countries. The typical approach to these types of crises is to 
pay people who run settlement camps per head by the sort of number of people they're supporting. And while that seems intuitive, the incentives are all off because the incentives are to keep people alive, but to not sort of support them to sort of move on with their lives. And so the test we're doing in Uganda now is giving people about $750 and letting them spend it however they want. You can also use cash for things like a universal basic income. And so I'm sure we'll talk about this more in Q&A. But the basic idea here is if you want to make sure that everybody is living up to a certain standard of living, one way to kind of me mechanically ensure that is to give everyone a cash transfer equal to the cost of that standard of living. And so GiveDirectly just launched a study in Kenya distributing different types of cash transfers to about 16,000 people, with some people receiving a universal basic income for up to 12 years. On the sort of other side of the spectrum, you can use cash transfers for things like disaster relief. And so something GiveDirectly did this year is launch in Texas and Puerto Rico and hand people out debit cards for about $1,500. That's not a life-changing amount of money in either of those places, but it does help sort of fill the gaps in terms of what people aren't receiving from the, their kind of existing support network or the existing NGOs doing disaster relief. And it lets people sort of buy whatever is their top priority within that price range. There's a big industry that exists around things like fair trade or CSR for companies to try to give back to the people they're working with. And so one thing we're testing with a, a sort of foundation arm of a coffee company is just giving cash transfers in a coffee growing area. And so we're working in eastern Uganda, picked an area where, which is growing a lot of coffee and, is give, and are giving people about those same $1,000 cash grants and seeing how it in general changes their lives as well as how it changes their coffee growing practices, whether they sort of start doing longer term practices and how they approach the plants and things like that. And this last thing is a project that I'm really excited about, which is something we're doing with USAID in Rwanda and potentially other countries, which is using cash as a literal benchmark for their existing programming. And so we're running side-by-side -side randomized control trials in Rwanda, uh, testing for, for goals that they have. And so in one case, it's a nutrition program that has specific nutrition goals, how we could structure a cash transfer program designed to meet those goals and basically produce a report card answering the question, is the programming you're doing better than just giving the people you're trying to help the cash and letting them spend it? And so that sort of provides a literal benchmark for us to say, are we allocating money correctly? And so something that's been happening in the sector as we've had this sort of mountain of evidence build up um, and as the sort of logistics of delivering cash has become a lot easier is that the sort of rhetoric has changed dramatically. It's less so that uh, the idea of giving cash is seen as crazy or nuts or corrupting. And instead you see things like this from Ban Ki-moon. He said that cash programming should be the preferred and default method of support. A diffid sort of summary of the evidence on cash called it perhaps the most thoroughly researched intervention out there. And so that's ex actually extremely exciting, except that the funding hasn't changed. That if you look at the sort of overall portfolio of how we're spending our money to help people, it's still spent mostly not by the recipients we're trying to help, and instead by policymakers and bureaucrats um, and donors in places like New York or DC or London. And so less than 1% of USAID funding is cash-based, less than 2% funding of UK aid funding is cash-based, and the same is true in the sort of humanitarian sectors as well. And I'll pause and note that the sort of rest of the pie is not the sort of give well top charities. It's not the kind of most evidence type interventions out there. There's a sort of remarkable inertia in the sector that we're still trying to fight. And the consequence is that because we're not sort of solving the kind of allocation problem at the front end, it gets solved on the back end a lot. And so you see things like this from one refugee camp where 70% of Syrian refugees were selling portions of food aid they were receiving to get what they actually wanted. And so the sort of markets are still responding to try to correct the allocation, but only further and further down the chain after that we've sort of shipped food from uh, other places into the country. And so what can we do about it? We have these sort of... Uh, really effective tools. We have this evidence as sort of donors, how can we approach this basic problem? Well, part of this kind of stagnation in the sector is that it doesn't respond uh, how sort of like consumer goods or in general a market economy ought respond. And so if you look at sort of a phone like a product, we've had remarkable innovation. We've gone from this the sort of rotary dial landline phones to the iPhone X or something like that. And the reason is because there are market incentives to respond to the consumer. 
Well, the problem with the development sector is that the donor is the person who pays, but the recipient is the person who's affected. And so you don't see the same types of incentives exist to have the same type of innovation. And so you often see sort of persistence in the same types of tools that we use again and again. And so somehow we have to become better donors. Uh, and so these are sort of three questions you can use to, to sort of force that and to force the organizations you're working with uh, to be more and more responsive to the people you're, you and they are trying to help. The first one is trying to understand what the end-to-end -end cost of the intervention is. How much of the, your sort of donation actually ends up in value provided to the recipient at the end of the road. Now there's lots of problems with overhead metrics and things like that, and this is not that. A problem with the sector is that it's heavily intermediated. And so one nonprofit will take your donation and give it to another nonprofit after sort of skimming a little bit off the top. They'll skim a little bit off the top for overhead and give it to another nonprofit. And even if the sort of reported overhead is very low, each of those nonprofits only taking about 1%, the sort of systemic overhead is extraordinarily high. That if you have a chain of those nonprofits repeatedly subgranting to each other, the end value that's reaching the recipient is actually very, very low. And that's a practice that you see again and again and again in the sector. The next thing is the sort of evidence backing that has there been an external randomized control trial of the sort of intervention that the organization is, is implementing? How do we actually know that it works? And use the same standard you would want for a medicine you would take or a product that you would sort of bet your life on. And lastly, there's this benchmark question. Is the sort of funding you're providing to the organization and the program that they're implementing doing more good than the people you're actually trying to help could if you just gave them the cash? Now, there's plenty of interventions that might meet that standard. Very specialized medical interventions, for example, or cases where there's you know, a public good problem, infrastructure, or maybe rule of law, if there's a particularly good giving opportunity there. But a lot of the things we're doing are trying to outspend the poor about things that they know far more about. And so I think there's a lot of the sort of spending we're doing uh, wouldn't meet this sort of basic test. I think the last thing that's worth pausing on before we go to Q&A and dig into a bunch of other, th other things is why is it worth giving it all? And here I would say that the sort of existence of incredible opportunities to have impact, I think cash is one of those, but there's lots of other nonprofits that are actually doing good work, provides a pretty uh, amazing opportunity to do something great with your life that uh, almost as a kind of side product of your day-to-day -day life by donating a certain small percent. Uh, your life can be basically the same, except as a side product, you can dramatically change and better lives of people who are living in extreme poverty. And that's a sort of cool opportunity to do with, uh, you, you know, your sort of 80 years on Earth. And so I, I think uh, uh, despite the sort of... Uh, the dark look on the sector. I think there is this sort of ex you know, incredible opportunity out there provided by good giving opportunities that uh, makes giving worth doing. And so with that, I'll, I'll sort of turn it over to questions uh, and looking forward to conversation. Um, I actually wanted to start with just a question about your own role. So this is amazing work. I mean, for example, the Malawi thing, I just learned about that yesterday about HIV. So you keep learning new things about cash transfers, which are amazing. But I'm curious, uh, from the financial angle, uh, what kind of unique problems, I imagine there are some that Give Directly deals with that you're exposed to. Yeah, it's, it's uh, in a lot of ways, it's focusing to just be able to spend most of your time on the kind of cash pipeline. And so on the finance side, my job is to sort of manage that entire pipeline from do donor to the first bank it hits in the US to the foreign exchange transaction to get to Kenyan shillings or Rwandan francs. Uh, the bank it sits there, and then the sort of getting to the more money provider and to the eventual recipient. And so the problems there are to first make sure that that pi pi pipeline is as short as possible, that money moves through the system incredibly quickly. And so problems we're sort of working on within that domain are things like how do we project donations so that we can keep field operations running basically just behind them so that the lag is very small. Um, second, how do we sort of manage that cash prudently, make sure we're getting an interest where we should and things like that. And then third, sort of making sure we're managing fraud, different sort of on the sort of internal side with uh, staff and things like that, and externally with mobile money providers or local government and things like that. And so the integrity of the pipeline is something I spend a lot of time on as well. Cool. Any life? I'm actually going to set up the Dory. Just one moment. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go. So, hey, um, my question is about. Um, whether 
an organization like yours pays a different amount than a giant multinational corporation like Google does to change currencies. It seems like something that's really important to the flow of, of money in, in this organization. And I, I wonder if there's an opportunity for multinational corporations to help out, not just by matching employees' donations, but maybe to um, assist with, with currency exchange in, in the currencies that they're already exchanging at gigantic quantities on a very frequent basis. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the kind of history of what we've paid uh, has changed. I, I think when we were sort of first getting started, we were pretty naive, and so we were paying about a percent sort of for per transaction, which would be extremely high for developed world currencies. It's a little bit what you'd expect for the kind of developing world currencies we're trading in. Uh, I think we've gotten better over time at competing different banks against each other. And so we have a US bank that quotes a rate, but we also competed against our sort of different local banks. And we've added different local banks over time to um, in part offer competition there, but also to offer um, kind of credit risk hedges basically while we're holding the cash there. And so the total fees we're paying have dropped a ton over time. Uh, and so now we're only sort of like a hair above 0% or something like that. That said, my guess is you know the Googles or something like that are probably being a step more clever. And so my guess is the same opportunity still probably exists. Um, I don't know how. I don't know how the tool would work, the sort of like piggybacking off the transfers, but uh, I bet there is something there in terms of, um, yeah, trying to be more clever. Um, I think also as we've grown, we've become a bigger player in, in these markets, you know, it's certainly the day we trade or something like that. And so I, I think that's helped in us getting better rates uh, versus our sort of us getting first getting started. Thank you. Uh, we can read from the first Dory question. So. What are the best reasons, in your view, to be skeptical about basic income projects or policies? Yeah, I think my biggest one, especially as it applies to the US or other places where, it feel, where basic income feels politically far, is that a UBI doesn't feel like a particularly useful North Star. That there's this sort of sense of a, a UBI as this utopic policy, and there's a, because of its sort of like elegance or simplicity, there's, there's a very good sense of what it should look like that it should be universal, it should be basic, which you, know, you could debate the exact number, but it's supposed to you know, sort of meet you know, so basic needs. Um, and, and so I think almost because it has this clear template for what you should do, uh, in places where that template is politically, would be politically pretty hard to implement soon, it doesn't tell you what the incremental policy should be to get there. And so in the US, things that feel more tractable and maybe then more exciting are things like expand to EITC or have a child grant or something like that. Um, and I worry a little bit that the uh, UBI and UBI pilots that, including GiveDirectly's, that are sort of testing the utopic version or the template version aren't providing a lot of light on how to get there or on the sort of pilots that should happen in the sort of nearer term on policies that are sort of more likely in, in the US. Um, I think for a lot of countries, a UBI could feel closer politically. India might be one example um, for which the sort of conversation and the pilots focusing on that template are actually pretty useful. Um, but in the US, I worry a lot about the distraction factor that we've like cut away the sort of wonk class who care about poverty in the US and focus them on a policy that uh, feels far. Yeah, and EITC is the earned income tax credit. It's a very large cash transfer in yeah. the US. Um, also note, in the comments of this question, there was a lot of discussion on inflation. Hmm. Um, so there was a study that was recently pursued from a Mexican uh, cash transfer program. I don't know if you want to talk about that, but it seemed to find that there was not inflation effects. Yeah or if you're familiar. Yeah, yeah, and so Mexico was one of the, in that sort of chart of the different cash transfer programs, they were sort of one of the leading innovators both in implementing a cash transfer program in the developing world and in actually testing it. And so the US had different types of cash support before then, but they were sort of really forward thinking as a government and working with academics to test the effects of cash transfers. And so they produced some of the early results on just how cash transfers work on the sort of individual level, um, but then also a recent analysis of those programs found that you don't see the kind of doomsday things people are worried about in terms of a basic income or in general expanding cash transfer programs in terms of 
price is just going up a ton to totally offset the value of the cash. That's something that we've seen in a couple of other studies done, uh, sort of evaluating that question. GiveDirectly's first study looked at it at a kind of village level and didn't see any effect on prices. A thing we have in works, though we don't have results out, is a, a study specifically designed to stress test that. And so we used our one-time grants and randomized the concentration of GiveDirectly's enrollment within a large region. And so there were high concentration areas and very low concentration areas. And then as we delivered what was sort of massive amounts of cash in the region, uh, researchers looked at prices in lo local markets, as well as quantity of goods supplied, um, local taxes and school fee payments, these sorts of different kind of macro or community level effects. And so um, those are results I think we'll have out early next year or so that I hope can sort of contribute to that debate as well. Um, I think on the theory of it, a lot of the ways people talk about inflation, the sort of econ model is too simple, that they're sort of holding constant how much can be supplied, that a lot of times either big companies can sort of respond to increases in demand by supplying more of the good, or oftentimes in the developing world something you see is the cash supplied increases, the, the cash given increases the supply. And so an example could be you would be worried that you gave cash to, some, uh, to an area and the area in general likes consuming fish and so the price of fish will go up. Uh, but the piece that you're missing is that often when people receive the cash, they buy boats or fishing nets um, or coolers to sort of be middlemen between fishermen and markets. And so actually the sort of quantity of supply of, of fish goes up as much or more. And so I think the sort of model people use to answer and think about the inflation question has to sort of not keep supply fixed when, when debating that part. Hello? Can I ask a question? Yes. OK. Sorry. Um, I would like to learn a little bit more about your UBI pilot in mm -hmm. Kenya, you said. And I know we have already talked about UBI a little bit, but I guess there is a reason behind um, Give Directly jumping into basic income. And you providing the service to 12,000 people, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm always wondering, like, how can you get from those results you're getting from the UBI, which is only paid to a fraction of people in the country then to a more universal aspect where all people would receive it and what are you hoping to learn and do you have any results as of far? Yeah, and so when GiveDirectly was sort of seeing the debate on UBI spike up again over the last couple of years, the thing we saw, what it was, was a debate about how a particular type of cash transfer works. There are these questions on the sort of pro side that it would enable different types of risk taking or entrepreneurship help people sort of live their lives better. Um, on the con side, people were worried that people would stop working or spend it badly or things like that. Um, and th those questions are testable. And so like other people sort of launching pilots, we saw this was very much within our sweet spot to implement a cash transfer program and then work with researchers to sort of test the results. Uh, the basic structure we used was kind of to design to test what's unique about a UBI versus other cash transfer programs. And so in part to get at your sort of a big piece of a UBI is that it's universal. And so we randomized at the village level with whole villages randomly assigned to receive cash or not. Um, and then we also randomly assigned some villages to receive cash for 12 years and some villages to receive cash for two because a scaled up version of UBI would be for your whole life, but a lot of the sort of pilots that have, have been done and that are sort of coming online are shorter term. And so a potential research question you might have is, can you extrapolate to how it would, the sort of incentives would actually be for people if they had that sort of longer term security? Again, on the sort of pro side and the con side. Um, and so that sort of full study just kicked off um, a couple of weeks ago, and so it'll be a little bit of a ways before we have results. The sort of first end lines and things like that will be within the next year or so, but so it won't be 12 years, uh, but it will be a little bit of time. That said, about a year ago, we started providing payments in one kind of pilot village. And so got to sort of ask people what it's like to receive a basic income. And obviously that's totally anecdotal. It shouldn't be confused with the RCT evidence, but even that was pretty interesting. Um, I think uh, if you sort of ask people what it's like, you see the things that are kind of consistent with the broader evidence. People spend it in a ton of different ways because they have different priorities. You saw a lot of spending on food, if people, especially sort of elderly people who couldn't work. Um, different types of investments in people's job or businesses, whether that's 
buying sort of small amounts of capital to, for a shoe business I saw, people actually buying fishing nets. It's an area right on the sort of edge of Lake Victoria. Um, people investing in school fees. Secondary school isn't free in, in Kenya. Um, health and things like that. Uh, some of the unique things were we were worried on the kind of uh, operational perspective, how people would perceive a UBI. Um, a sort of few different aspects of that. One of them is universality. Um, even though the sort of village we're working in and the groups of villages we're working in are in absolute terms all very, very poor, there's still a different, decent amount of income variation within those villages. And so in this particular one, the poorest people had walls you could essentially see through and the sort of whole house was made from organic materials, mud and thatch and things like that. And the sort of richest couple had a tractor. Um, and so that's a sort of remarkable distance in uh, wealth and in income and things like that. And so one thing we asked people was just, how do you feel that everyone's getting the same amount of cash support? Does it seem fair? Should give directly, as we often do, try, tried to have picked the poorest people in this village? Um, and people responded pretty uniformly that they were like, we were glad you didn't try to meddle, that you just sort of didn't try to pick uh, who should receive. And so that was pretty interesting from a sort of perceived fairness perspective about a UBI um, and connects to some of the debate people have about the stigmatization of uh, receiving benefits or things like that. Um, another, again, qualitative thing we asked people about was whether individually targeted payments were okay. Um, a kind of potential benefit of a UBI is that it frees people in relationships because each person has their own individual security. And so if a relationship is abusive or there's a bad power dynamic, somebody could leave or at least be on a more level playing field. Uh, the flip side, if you're a foreign organization, is that it could look like you're trying to break up families by insisting that each person has their own cell phone and their own stream of payments. And so we are worried that that would be perceived badly. Uh, again, the surprise was that basically everyone said just the opposite, that individually targeted payments let people prioritize whatever was their top priority and sort of made debates easier. There was this sense of he has his, his money and I have my money and we get to spend it on what we want. And so there's not as much of a, for the UBI payments, a shared pool that has to be fought over. And so that was pretty interesting as well. Thank you. And uh, yeah, the, some of the negative income tax experiments in the 70s seemed at first to suggest that divorce rates went up, but subsequent analysis found that it didn't. So yeah. uh, it's interesting how this um, individual, individuality versus family orientation yeah. plays into everything. Um, I wanted to learn a little bit more about the evaluation of the cash transfer program. So uh, firstly, I wanted to know how long you track people for after they've received the cash payment. And then in terms of logistics and scaling up, do you think that the evaluation model you have right now could be then used by, say, a USAID or one of the other uh, big donors for evaluating? Yeah, and so it varies a lot by study. And so different studies are targeted towards different questions which require a different uh, time horizon. The kind of basic template structure is First, external researchers, and so academics at places like MIT or Harvard who are sort of helping design the study with us. Um, an external research surveying organization, and so it's not give directly staff asking people about their consumption patterns. It's sort of different people from a different organization who don't have a relationship with us. Um, it's important to pre-register the study, basically sort of say, we're going to do this study, provide a pre-analysis plan which says, we're going to answer these questions. That helps sort of solve for cherry picking on the studies, as in ho not holding back studies that have bad results or no results, uh, as well as cherry picking on the analysis, not sort of redoing the analysis again and again until you get the sort of results you want. Um, after that, in terms of the horizon, again, that's varied a lot for us. We have one study that is going to have it's something like 18 month results out some early next year, but it's sort of queued up to attract people for a decade or so in terms of the sample size and things like that. Um, because Give Directly is younger, our ability to have a super long horizon already done is harder. Um, in the sort of existing literature, the longest follow up is a, the, a paper in Uganda that, tr that, that was that sort of $400 cash grant I mentioned to youths. And that's gone out to, I think, the eight-year mark um, and sort of found persistent results. 
Um, and there's been a study in Sri Lanka that went out to five years and found it was cash transfers to small business people and found at the five year mark markedly different uh, earnings sort of even persisting to that level. Um, I, in terms of scale, in part, you know, the, the program we were doing with USAID is a good example of large funders are still able to run those types of randomized control trials. In many ways, the big con about RCTs is that they're expensive. You have to have giant samples. Um, you have to be able to fund things like research costs and things like that. And so in many ways, large funders are best equipped uh, to help implement them. I have a quick follow-up on that. Um, so it seems like there have been some long-term evaluations. Have there been long-term uh, treatments in the same way that, I mean, certainly not in the cash transfer space is my understanding, but are you aware of others? Right. The 12 years is pretty remarkable. Yeah, and so I think the examples, uh, what I haven't seen as much of is long-term evaluation paired with long-term treatment. Yep. Uh, the long-term treatments I've seen are in places like Brazil and Mexico that have followed, been targeted towards families with young children and provided conditional cash transfers to send their children to school and followed families for a long period as a result. And so getting into that sort of decade long type time period. Yep. And so I think we have seen examples of that. Um, I haven't seen the, personally, the evaluation paired to sort of check what is it like to receive cash for 12 years, um, but I, I do think we have seen sort of examples of that long-term treatment. Yep. I think we had a question on the VC real quick. Um, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm Krishna. Uh, I was just wondering how does Give Directly uh, compare with basic education? The only other... Uh, Thing that I found having extraordinary impact is basic education. I mean, and of course, Malala says until until high school. Uh, but how does it compare? How should I think of giving to the give directly versus giving for basic education? This is give directly versus a basic education. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, to any education charities working for you know getting girls in school or things like that in the developing countries, of course. Yeah, and so I think the case for a basic education in a country or something like that is is very good. And I think uh, it's a good example of the type of public good or public infrastructure that is hard for cash to just sort of replace. Uh, and so in many ways, I think they're not competitive and in fact are often complementary. That uh, a big thing we see people consume when we give people cash are school fees to be able to go to school or school uniforms or school supplies or solar lights to light a home to sort of do homework and things like that. And so I think there's a lot of compliments on in the sort of ecosystem. That said, as a kind of giving opportunity, I think especially for nonprofits, it's hard to be helpful providing a basic education. And so I think it's a hard thing to do. And so I don't know of a lot of really good giving opportunities to directly support basic education, even though I think it's a useful thing for a country to provide and it's an important thing for a country to have. Uh, it's similar to, I think it's hard for uh, nonprofits to build bridges or to build hospitals, that I think that those sorts of big, lasting institutions you want to exist in societies are hard to provide through sort of donated dollars. And so um, as concepts, I think they're complementary and both important. And I think as giving opportunities, the case for cash is a little bit better. Thank you. Uh, hi, so I'm curious how you guys think about balancing your portfolio. So um, both like geographically, how do you choose the locations you're, gonna, you're going to uh, kind of deploy the programs to? Um, and then how do you kind of split between research programs and just funding the programs you already know work pretty well? Um, I guess I'm also especially interested in uh, the decision to start the program in Houston. Um, which seems like an outlier in terms of like how much money you gave per person and also like how much that money can buy. Um, so yeah, just how do you kind of think about balancing your overall portfolio? Yeah. Um, and so in general, our mission is not to sort of, we, we don't have like an expand mission. Uh, uh, we don't have the goal of like be in every country on earth or sort of provide every structure of cash transfer. Uh, we're pretty focused. Well, I'll talk about the sort of Houston and Puerto Rico thing, but in general, we're pretty focused within East Africa, and sort of each edition of a country is sort of targeted towards a particular goal, a research program that we think is especially valuable or sort of important for policy impact. Um, against that kind of baseline, the way we sort of evaluate new projects is, I think, a big potential value 
of cash transfers is the indirect effects on the, the, the sector. And, and there's a few different sectors, whether it's pr providing research that's especially useful for developing world governments in designing their own cash transfer programs, um, providing cash transfer structures that provide benchmarks for aid programs that exist around the world, um, or in general sort of pushing on the debate about how we should help people. Um, the sort of Houston and Puerto Rico examples, we debated a lot internally. What we saw was basically an opportunity to connect different conversations. A kind of weird thing that happens in conversations about giving and especially about cash is they can stay pretty disjointed. And so the basic income conversation can happen without referencing any of the papers within the developing world about a lot of what we already know about how cash transfers work. And so there can be sort of remarkable ig ignorance about all of the things that have already been studied. Um, we can sort of throw up our hands in Texas about how do we help people without any of the sort of sense about how helpful cash transfers can be in that type of situation. And so. We sort of saw it as an opportunity to, one, in part, provide a, a set of pipes to deliver cash for donors who probably weren't going to give to East Africa otherwise. There were people who specifically wanted to give to Texas or to Puerto Rico. Um, and so we sort of could provide that utility to enable that. Um, and then two, sort of provide the kind of cash alternative in a new conversation. Um, that we hope will sort of carry over into the broader conversation in aid and in basic income or something like that. And so um, the bet here, I think, is that we can sort of connect conversations that are staying disparate um, and that the, there isn't a sort of otherwise an allocation from East Africa to Texas, that there are sort of different giving pools. Um, and if that's the case, then it's absolutely the case that there should be some type of utility for people to, to give to Texas and to, to help those people um, better than the sort of existing opportunity set. Move to the, back to the jury. Uh, this is a question I had actually, which was about the savings compacts that were reported in this Fox article on the basic income experiment where people sort of pool up their payments and give it to a single person so that they can engage in more capital intensive investments or things like that. Um, it seems like that presents an opportunity for financial institutions or other changes, so curious to your thoughts on that. Yeah, and so the quick, uh, slightly longer explanation of what this is, is in this UBI pilot village where people were receiving basic income payments, a thing people wanted to do was purchase big things, bigger than what their monthly check was. And so they formed different types of groups within the village and basically made a ledger of each person every month contributes some portion of their basic income payment, and one person every month receives all of those payments. And so it's a way to convert those stream payments into sort of semi-recurring lump sum ones instead. Um, in terms of financial institutions, I think people do have access, and so I think maybe the opportunity is like a, a sales one. And so M-Pesa is the mobile money provider in Kenya, and it has a ton of different savings and loan products built in. Um, you can have basically a savings account on these feature phones, the same ones that have Snake and things like that. You can have a savings account. You can draw a loan through your M-Pesa account. Recently, they added the ability to buy government bonds, again, through these, these sort of mobile money accounts, which is pretty neat. And so one thing I ha a question I have is whether or not you'll start to see a take up of that as people, you know, as the sort of need or demand for these types of services persists and maybe you'll build comfort. Um, and then on the other side, potential, there's a sort of potential for better outreach and things like that from financial institutions. There are also kind of small banks and uh, microfinance companies uh, in Kenya that I could see potentially moving in. I, I haven't seen that happen much yet, but I, I can totally buy that it could. Yep. Would you guys be willing to, I mean, you're sort of underwriting um, these things at that point. Is there like a written guarantee of the, the stream? Right. It's, it, yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't know how to turn the give directly promise into like a, a, a something you could lend off of or something like that. It's a yeah. verbal guarantee, but yep. um, may, maybe the sort of track record by year three or something like that it, it right. enables that. I don't know. So I think we're just about time, but one last question on the efficiency of the uh, transfer efficiency of the basic income experiment relative to cash transfers. And yeah. Maybe long run expectations there. Yeah, and so. The, the kind of different trade-offs for the basic income experiment are um, 
there are more payments and mobile money providers have a per payment fee. Um, and so there's more payments per value distributed. And so mobile money fees are a little bit higher. We have to have our call center running longer per recipient because people are getting paid for two years. And so there's higher follow-up costs. That said, the total value distributed is higher uh, per recipient than our sort of typical $1,000 uh, payments. And the way that all nets is that the two-year arm is much less efficient. It's something like 75 or 80 percent. The 12-year arm is much more efficient. Uh, and the sort of combination of those two, the sort of weighted average across those different arms, is about in that sort of 88, 90 percent range. Um, the next question on efficiency was actually Harvey, Harvey which is pretty interesting. Uh, and so we found the kind of balance of costs are very different. Labor is a lot more expensive to sign people up for cash here than in East Africa. Um, but there's, absolute, there's zero FX for us. And uh, payments are cheaper. Where the sort of debit cards are basically zero fees for us and for the recipients. And so uh, efficiency at the scale we're, we're, we'll be able to operate at is a little bit higher than our typical program. Interesting. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming to Google. Yeah, thank you so and much for having me.